My disclosures of commercial support, first and foremost, as Jenny mentioned, I work for the Glycemic Index Foundation, which is a not-for-profit health promotion charity, originally established by Diabetes Australia, the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation of Australia, and the University of Sydney. So uh, that's my primary conflict of interest, and they did help uh, get me here. And some of the products I'm going to show in the presentation do carry our certification trademark, which of course is the subject of my talk. Uh, secondly, I do speak a fair bit, and often I get paid for it, which is kind of nice. And uh, there's a list of the ones that have paid for me over the last five years. And I, like a few of the other speakers, do um, have a few books that I've put together over the last few years. And if you're really interested, I can show you them in the break. Um, as far as mitigating potential bias... Is it better, girl? OK. Um, I'm going to show that there's actually two methods of making GI claims on the labels of food. So I'll be showing both of those methods and results of research with respect to that. So first of all, I thought I should show you a little bit about Australia. Um, I like to start with the good news, and there is some. I think it's quite important to note that Australians are living for longer. You will no doubt <laughs> not be able to live this back there in the back of the room, but the top of the pile is Japan. Though my oldest son tells me a lot of them are actually dead and they just don't report it. <laughs> Australia is second, which is pretty good. And we're, we're gaining quite rapidly. And then the United Kingdom and the United States. So, and you can see there's this very nice increase. In fact, it's uh, increased about 10 years over the past 50 years, which is quite an achievement. I think we should all be clapping ourselves on the back for that one. And it, of course, has some implications as well for diabetes, which I'll talk about later. And the other fascinating fact is that we're all growing taller in Australia too. And in fact, it's been about a centimetre a decade, which is quite substantial when you think about it. Though it has started to tailor off, and I have a few pet theories about that, particularly with my children who are sort of curled over their laptops and iPads. And I think that's a similar story in North America as well. So that may have an effect. They don't get outside, they don't play as much, they're not getting as much sunshine. But all, overall, it's a, it's a good news story. The bad news, of course, well, I think you all have the impression that Australians are sort of tall, blonde Aussies. You see us in the movies and in your TV shows, you know, Nicole Kidman and uh, Hugh Jackman. I think we look like that, but the reality, unfortunately, is more like that. And uh, about six out of ten Australian adults now are overweight or obese, which is pretty high, and we're about 21st in the sort of global ladder, if you like, so depending on which uh, study you look at. Um, and you can see here a comparison. So we've got uh, United States, England and Canada, I guess, representing the main groups in the room today. Uh, you can see we are right up there, and, and it is increasing fairly rapidly. In fact, the rate of increase has been one of the most dramatic, I think, in the world. And of course, on its coattails, as we all have heard over the last couple of days, uh, diabetes is going up al along with it. Um, I would argue, of course, it's also partly due to the increased lifespan. So you know, that's a positive thing. And also, as we've heard in, uh, over the last few days, that people with diabetes are actually managing their condition better and living for longer. So prevalence rates are going up for good reasons. It's not all bad news either, for that matter. Uh, gestational diabetes is going up. That's the pink line at the bottom, even though it's hard to see on this scale. Uh, type 1 is, is relatively stable in Australia. And of course, no surprises, the type 2 is the greatest growth area. And if we sum up those three, we work out there's about one and a half million Australians with diabetes at the moment, which is a substantial amount given there's about 23 million Australians in the population. So it's about 8% of the population. Now there was a study called OzDia back in the year 2000 that suggested that for every person with diagnosed diabetes, there was somebody else who had it and didn't know it, and that's this red line here. So there could be a lot more um, because of uh, poor diagnosis. So is carbohydrate the villain? Um, like you, unfortunately, sugar phobia has come down under. We tend to inherit the, the fad diets from other parts of the world. Uh, this particular slide is rather close to Jenny and I's heart, uh, which was focusing on, on sugar in particular. When the WHO draft guidelines came out uh, over a year ago, now they got a lot of mention. Um, sorry, I'll go back to that. 
uh, and particularly about the 5% uh, draft guideline, but when they were released in final draft this year, got no media attention whatsoever, I might add, when it reinforced the 10%. And of course, there's been that sugar film, which I think is probably coming to North America <laughs> soon, which is, you know, supersized me, but about sugar. Quite entertaining, but, but hopelessly mixed up. So there's certainly an awful lot about it. And of course, last but not least, the paleo diet is really big in Australia. And I did check out some of the local bookstores, and I know that it's big up here as well. So carbohydrates are really on the nose. What are Australians actually eating? I'm sure at the back you can't read that. So we've had two national nutrition surveys in Australia, one in 1995, which was about 14,000 people, representative sample um, of all Australians, and then 2011-12, about 12,000 people. Very similar method, 24-hour recall, uh, standard sort of procedure. And you can see that uh, protein intake has gone up uh, mildly, slightly from 93 to 94 grams. Fat intake has actually gone down ever so slightly, as has total carbohydrate and in particular total sugars and total starch. So, you know, we really have, I think, followed the fads. We've followed the fat fad and we've been following the anti-carb fad. Um, dietary fibre, unfortunately, has gone along, it's gone down with it, which there's no real surprise there because we know that dietary fibre is mostly in carbohydrate containing foods. And perhaps everybody's trying to drown their, their tears because they're all drinking more. <laughs> so, are we eating too many carbohydrates? No, in fact, if you have seen the latest guidelines for what defines a low, sorry, a high carb diet, which is 45% of energy or more. Australians actually eat a moderate carbohydrate diet. I think there's the perception we get a lot of media from North America, and I know you have a higher carbohydrate intake than us. We don't have a high carb intake. It's moderate, and it has been going down over the past 15 or so years. Um, I've had a couple of master's students over the last semester, and they have very kindly looked at the um, uh, average GI and GL of the Australian population and in 2011-12 in we estimate it's about 54 and a half which appears to have gone down slightly so when we last looked at it in about 2003 it was about 57 and I'd like to suggest that uh, one of the reasons it's gone down a little bit is because of the efforts of our GI symbol program in Australia. Um, glycemic load is still relatively high and uh, you'll see there the guidelines that have been put together by various groups including ours is to, um, my pointer stopped working, there it is, to, to try and aim for 45. So still, we still need to lower the average population's dietary glycemic index by about 10 units, we believe, uh, in order to get the glycemic load under the 100 unit mark. And I would argue, certainly in Australia, to, to prevent any more adverse effects like decreasing fibre intake, we should be focusing on lowering the GI rather than lowering the GL. So that brings me on to the GI Symbol Program. It's a certification trademark. Um, we first registered it in Australia and New Zealand in 2002. It has been registered in the United States and the European Union, and also a selection of Asian countries as well. And that's what it looks like. Um, there are some specific criteria, and again, you probably can't read it at the back. So we do require them to meet the ISO. Uh, so they have to test to the ISO standard. And also, of course, they must be a source of carbohydrate. No low GI claims on bottles of water, thanks. <laughs> and in addition to that, they must, of course, meet a variety of nutrition criteria. Because when we started formulating the program back in the late 90s, you know, we were aware, of course, that chocolate had a low GI and didn't really think it was a good thing to be promoting it to people, not, not for everyday foods, anyway. So we included criteria for kilojoules, for total carbs, the total and saturated fat, uh, sodium, and in certain foods, dietary fibre and calcium. And these are very category specific, so each uh, major food category has its own slightly different set of criteria. Here is one example uh, for obviously, and, and in most countries in the world, as I think we've heard again over the last few days, bread is the number one source of glycemic carbohydrate. It still is in Australia as well. So uh, yes, it must contain at least 10 grams of carb per serve. Uh, there are low-carb breads coming on the market in Australia, sad to say. Um, it must have less than 5 grams of fat, or if it's more than that, less than 20% of that from saturated fats. Um, uh, sorry, this is breakfast cereals. I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, too much jet lag. So uh, very similar anyway. Um, and there's, there's an exemption here basically around uh, the muesli-type products, so uh, Swiss muesli, traditional muesli, etc. 
Dietary fibre, three grams of fibre per 100 grams or more to make it a good source, and sodium 400 milligrams per 100 grams or less. And uh, this, really, this model really does help identify the healthier choices within each food category. The bread category is very similar. And breakfast cereals is our number two source of, of carbohydrate and glycemic load in Australia. Um, here's a, selam, a selection of uh, products that carry the logo. So basically in every major category of carbohydrate containing food, there is a product that carries the low GI symbol. And uh, it's not just brand name products tucked away down in the corner here. We do have Australia's second largest uh, supermarket chain that's part of the program, and some of their um, house brand or home brand products also carry the logo. So it's not just catering to the wealthy people. We're very pleased that it's also uh, catering to people who obviously have less disposable income, the people that arguably need it the most. Um, in addition to our GI symbol program, there is, of course, uh, a provision within our food standards for generic low GI claims, and I'll go through those now. Uh, but in order to do so, I need to give a bit of the backstory, and I think Tom's already touched on some of the story uh, this morning. We actually approached Standards Australia way back in 2003 uh, to develop an Australian standard, and we convened a working party in 2004. There were scientists from the GI Foundation, um, also from the Commonwealth Scientific Investigation and Research Organisation, as the name suggests, a, a government scientific research organisation and Australia's Food and Grocery Council. So industry, government and not-for-profit were involved and also Food Standards Australia and New Zealand had an involvement as well. As you can see, it took a few years and many meetings to get the Australian Standard uh, gazetted. And then it took, after that had been gazetted, it actually took another um, five or six years and about 70 meetings, I might add, to develop the international standards. So, and of course, that was a far more global um, project and involved many of the scientists, in fact, that are in this room today, which is really good. And I'm very pleased with the results that uh, Thomas showed this morning, which makes it all feel worthwhile because at the time it was a bit laborious. Um, now, of course, in parallel with that, uh, and not entirely coincidentally, the new nutrition, health, and related claim legislation was being discussed and debated. And basically, this was looking to make um, higher level health claims like you have in North America and some other parts of the world. But in relation to some of those claims, of course, the glycemic index and load were uh, mentioned and uh, some, in particular some members suggested that um, they should be included as nutrition content claims rather than function claims or higher level health claims. And I think there'll be a bit more discussion of that later because most of the scientists in Australia considered the glycemic index or load uh, to be a property of the food of itself rather than relating to specific health outcomes. Um, and they deliberately decided not to describe the method in the draft, they just refer to the Australian standard. So to make generic health claims in Australia, you have to comply with the Australian standard, unlike the GI symbol program, which requires ISO. Now this is what it looks like in the end. So <laughs> again, you can see it takes a long way, a long time to go down this path. So 2013 was when this legislation, so nearly 10 years later, was finally gazetted. Uh, and they have defined glycemic index, which you can probably read quite well back there. So glycemic index means the property of the carbohydrates in different foods, specifically the blood glucose raising ability of the digest digestible carbohydrates in a given food. So a, a pretty simple and quite clear definition of what it means. And then they recommend uh, there's a nutrition profile scoring system. And I'll show you a little bit about that in a minute. Um, that it must meet um, that, and also it defines low, medium, and high GI. Now, they're actually defined in the Australian standard in, and in the international standard as well, but it is also reiterated in the Food Standards Code. So there is no confusion as to what low, medium, and high means. And this is the Food Standards Australia, New Zealand, Nutrition Profile Exploring <coughs> Calculator. You can see it's actually very similar, though it came, I might add, many, many years later to ours, kilojoules, saturated fats, it includes total sugars, which is offset by credits for dairy foods and fruit, and sodium, and then protein and dietary fibre. And in fact, when we compare the two models, um, they produce essentially the same results. The correlation is over 0.9 between the two models, which is great news from our perspective, given that we were uh, preceding them in its development. And here's an example of a food you probably can't see that at the back, but it says in, in fairly small print here, low GI, high in fibre, naturally sweetened with honey. 
So uh, not quite as conspicuous as the GI symbol, of course. What is the consumer experience? Uh, we did a whole series of um, uh, consumer research studies from the time that we launched in Australia. In fact, just prior to the launch, we launched in July, we did a baseline study, and we did a whole series up to 2012. All much the same. You'll recognise some of the companies, News Poll and AC Nelson, no doubt. So large, reputable research companies that were independent from us conducted the research in all of the Australian mainland, mainland capital cities, um, random samples of adults, and basically we had pretty similar questions throughout most of those years overall. And you can see in the last one in this series, it was about 1,500 Australians, and again, it was a representative sample. Now, from these studies, we found, in fact, after about three years of launching, uh, the consumer awareness went up to about eight out of 10 Australians and remained and has remained that way ever since, which is pretty quick when you think about it. And um, I bet you can probably see down this blue box here, back in the, uh, 2002, awareness was about 28%. So there was a very rapid um, uh, increase in consumer awareness of GI over a relatively short period of time. So even if that's the case in your own country at the moment, if awareness is fairly low, it can increase fairly rapidly over a short period of time through appropriate marketing and, and public relations activities. 70% um, of those who are aware of it understand it's about sh blood sugars or blood glucose and energy, which is great. And, um, and around about 70%, 7 out of 10, suggest that they're going to use it when they're choosing food. Now, the awareness is greatest amongst females. That is kind of deliberate. So most of our marketing activities have focused on particularly young and middle-aged women uh, of childbearing age uh, for a whole variety of reasons. You can see the 25 to 39-year-old age group in particular. But there is another bounce, of course, in those who are over 50 when, of course, diabetes starts to become an issue. So diabetes in Australia starts to go up after about age 45 years. So when you've got diabetes, obviously, you learn more about carbohydrates, and glycemic index is certainly taught by diabetes educators and dietitians in Australia. Um, and as far as that was awareness, but what do they actually understand? I think this is equally important. And the main messages that about eight out of 10 of them understand is that it provides sustained energy or sustained release of glucose, if you like. Um, I might add that this most recent research was after Diogenes was published, which got a lot of publicity in Australia. And certainly there was a good understanding with respect to weight loss and long-term or longer-term weight management. And then good for general children's health and well-being. Um, again, uh, a lot of the studies around cognition uh, were uh, publicised in Australian media around that time, so that's where that links in. And then useful for ex exercise endurance for, for increased performance. Uh, and really the evidence is relevant to all life stages across the community. Now, uh, the GI symbol itself, so that was GI in general. The GI symbol itself, I might add that we did change... Oops, sorry. <laughs> okay, I need to speed up. Um, there are, we changed from an older version to a newer version. And you can see uh, it was 37%, so nearly 4 out of 10 Australians were aware of it. Um, and most of those people that are aware of it, 80% of them realise that it's healthy, wholesome and a good choice. It's scientifically tested and provides sustained energy and glucose release. And of course, we're very happy with all of those messages. Uh, and I think it's my last slide. Um, consumer research, we, the most recent consumer research focused more on some subgroups and in particular relevance for this um, audience is the diabetes group. And awareness of GI in general was about 6 out of 10 and for the GI symbol about 5 out of 10 amongst that group, for more, a representative sample from around Australia. And in general, people with type 2 diabetes look for low GI whole grain and high fibre claims. And for those who are aware of the low GI claims, 81% of them look for the GI symbol. So they're very loyal. People with diabetes that are aware of GI are very loyal to the GI symbol. I might skip over that one for the sake of time. So in summary, um, I believe that we need a global food and nutrition strategy to address the diabetes epidemic. Uh, decreasing the average dietary glycemic index and load, I think, can be part of that strategy. And I think in Australia, we've demonstrated quite clearly that it is possible to identify and promote healthy low GI foods to the general population. It can be done. Uh, the GI Foundation and its GI symbol uh, has worked down under and it's ready to be rolled out globally. So happy to discuss that with you later in the, the breaks. And thank you for listening.